itself, if you're not familiar with version control with Git and GitHub, or you want to know more about the reproducibility and computing practices in the lab, uh, you should check out this video. Um, what does it mean to be reproducible? It means that you're able to redo the exact same analysis today, tomorrow, or in 10 years and get the exact same result. Are people really reproducible? Yes, there is even a 10 year reproducibility challenge where people try to redo or replicate the analysis of a paper they published 10 years ago. So how, how does this reproducible script even look like? So we can start by looking one of my reproducible scripts. Oh, here it is, carrot. Okay, so let's look at one of my scripts. So basically for these reproducibility script, I describe at the beginning, I put a to-do section, things that I still have to do for this project. This is very good when you have different projects that you're tackling. Uh, short description of the data, short paragraph about this is what's gonna go in the paper. And then I simply have text and commands. So, and the important thing about these scripts is that I write to myself. I say, I'm gonna copy the tar files and the Mr. Base node to start with, and these are the commands. Now we run the script and these are the commands. So you're really talking to yourself in these scripts, copying and pasting all the commands that you have. I even have these messages. So, well, we have an error and then I copy the error that I get. And if you see, I mean, I'm not gonna guide you through this whole thing. It's actually quite long. It has all the different steps that I did to do this analysis. So it's very important that you create these, not just a copy paste of the scripts, but you actually want text guiding you through the scripts. Okay. So key characteristics of a script file, it presents a fluid story. It needs to be understandable to you. It is written in Magda or text file, not Word, and we will get to that in Git. It combines text with shell commands and points at specific scripts. Uh, it begins with a to-do section. This is something that I tend to do for myself. Okay, the do's and don'ts. Use text file markdown or markdown so you can track changes with Git. More on this later. Write a story, not just a command. Think of this as a dear diary document. You're writing to yourself every single step that you're doing. Explain the step and the rationale for the choices. Don't just say we pick lambda equal to 0.1, say why you're picking that value. Work on the script at the same time you're doing the work. This is very important because it's very easy to just do the work and then say, I'm gonna write the script later or the, the, the text file later. No, you have to do it at the same time. It will feel like you're doing twice the work because you're writing and you're doing, and it is doing twice the work, but, in the future, you won't need to redo things from scratch. You will simply go to your script, redo things. It will be just as simple. Copy output from the commands as well the commands if the output is needed to understand the story. Don't use Word. Don't wait until the end to create this file. You might have forgotten important things. Don't simply copy a list of commands. And also don't worry about grammar, punctuation, complex. This is not a written document you know, where the, the writing should be beautiful. Just focus on having all the details and make it understandable to you. Um, the ingredients for a successful reproducible practice, you need a text editor, Visual Studio Code, Emacs, RStudio, these are the ones that I've used. Knowledge of markdown syntax, and knowledge of version control, and the right folder structure. And in this talk, we're gonna cover all these four points. Well, the first one is just the, the text editor, which you, as you have seen, I use Visual Studio Code but it could be any text editor. Uh, markdown syntax, uh, there are many notes already online and actually these slides are available for anyone to use. Uh, so people can just look at the markdown format at the very end. So you can put uh, stars around text to make it lies or double stars to bold, uh, put inline code with this uh, quote reverse quotes or putting links and or specific links in text and having headers with this pound sign. So pound is the level one header, two pounds, second level, et cetera. So learning about the markdown format will make your scripts or your reproducible scripts or your notebooks uh, look nicer. The other ingredient is to learn how to use Git and GitHub. 
And this is very important because we have multiple files that are meant to be different versions of the same file. And we don't wanna be saving version one, version two, version three. So we want to have just one version of the file, but keeping track of all the history. And that's what Git and GitHub do. Um, so keep track of history of changes, uh, time travel. So being able to access your file from the past and peace of mind about breaking stuff. There is this famous quote from Hadley Wigman, who is the creator of Digiplot, is a widely used package in R that says, using Git commit is like using anchors or other protection when climbing. If you're crossing a dangerous rock phase, you want to be sure that you have a lot of protection to catch you if you fall. Commits play a similar role. If you make a mistake, you can fall past the previous commit, but that will catch you. You won't fall more than the previous commit. Coding without commits is like pre-climbing. You can travel much faster in the short term, but in the long term, the chances of catastrophic failure are high. So just like rock climbing protections, you want to be judicious with the use of commits. So committing too frequently will slow you down, but also um, you want to use more commits if you're uncertain or then you're scared. Commits are also helpful to others because they show your journey, not your, your destination. The first thing is to have a GitHub account. So I have a link here. Install Git, this is likely done for most computers and configure it Git if you need to, but that's, uh, most computers already have hit. And to, to stop and check at this moment, you have to know, can I open my terminal? For me, that's very easy. I just click here. You, maybe this is the first time you're using the terminal. So you need to know where to find it. And I like to put it here so for easy access. And then how do I know if Git is installed? Well, in the terminal, you need to type which Git. And there is a path. So Git is there. If you don't get anything, from which Git, that means that Git is not installed and you need to look at the installation of Git. The basics from Git is to create a GitHub repository. You, have, you open a GitHub repository, you're on GitHub, and then you just click this green button that says new, and that will open up a new repository page. I'm not gonna do this for now, and I'm just gonna use a dummy repo that I created for these purposes. You want to create the GitHub repository online and then you wanna clone it into your computer. The cloning process means that it's just downloading everything that's up there into your computer. After you have it in your local version, you can make any changes locally, just like we normally would with any script. And then these are the main three steps that you just need to remember, git add, git commit, and git push. So let's just use the dummy repo for these. Here you just click on copy, and then I need to know where I am. So I'm gonna just get into the desktop for now. I do git clone, and then everything from the dummy repo is being added. Get into the dummy repo. Yep, and then I am I am in there. If I want to make any changes, for example, I have this, I wanna, I could change the readme file and I can add some lines to practice GitHub in the lab. Feel free to git clone and make additions yourself. This is a line that I'm just adding in my editor, just like I would normally. I open the file and then added it. I open the file using open readme, but you can also go to your finder and find it on the desktop, dummy repo, and then double click on readme. Same thing. Okay. You save it. And now once I'm in my local dummy repo, I have my terminal formatted so that it shows me red when I have made any changes. You probably don't have this. But if you do git status, it will show you a list of the files that have been modified by you locally. So you have the readme file that was modified. You maybe have different files modified. So now you need to do git add, git commit, git push. Git add, with me. This will, it's called stage, stage the changes that you made. Then git commit dash M because we need to have a commit message that will help you know what were the changes that you made. So added sentence about contribution in readme. This is what I did. Make sure to have a meaningful message in the git commit. And finally, git push. push. So if we look at the GitHub repository, aha, the line is right here. 
this is possible because I am the owner of this repository. So if you clone it yourself, you won't be able to push directly. You have to be the owner. So we will talk in the next slides. How do you contribute to someone else's repository? If this is a new repository that you created, you should be able to push without any. So this is what we just did. Um, you have a new project, whatever project, you just remember git, git add, git commit, git push. In the git add, if you do git add dot, that adds all the changes. So in our case, we had modified just one file. You could have modified multiple files. Instead of listing them all, you can do git add dot. And this stage all the file. And it's very important that you push frequently. You do not want your code to live in your computer, um, just in your computer. You really want to have the backup in GitHub. So don't wait until your code is perfect to push it on GitHub. You really want your push every day. Now, another thing that it's important that the fourth point on reproducibility is having the right folder format and file names. So your project folder should have the following subfolders scripts folder, data folder, results folder, figures folder, and manuscript folder. These are the standard. And all the files should follow the good naming practices. These are very good slides by Jenny Bryan that encourage people to check. Uh, and that means no spaces on file names, no symbols, have meaningful names, don't just use the word script, dot r, that, that's not meaningful, and easy to sort. So these are the, the guidelines, but you could check there are many others that uh, Jenny Bryan puts, it, puts in her notes. When you start collaborating with other people, that's when things can go tricky with GitHub because different people are gonna be pushing to the same repository and there could be conflicts. So you, we want to learn how to resolve conflicts and how to collaborate with other people. One way in collaborating with people is to fork other people's repository. So sometimes you identify a repository that does work that you're interested in, but perhaps you would like to do some modification. You can fork this repository and work on the fork version as if it were your own repository. So in here, this is what you would have to do for this dummy repo. So instead of cloning it and working on a clone directly, you wanna go up here to where it says fork and click on fork. What that will create is a new version, just a copy of this repository into your uh, GitHub user. So try to do that for this dummy repo. So you just click fork and then you will have to do exactly what we showed before. So you do git clone of your fork and then you modify your files, git add, git commit, git push. So you have the original repository. You do a fork here, you have your own repository and then you do a clone into your computer. So the top row here is what lives on GitHub and then the, the bottom row is your computer, your local computer. So you have a local version of your fork. What you were doing before was just cloning directly from that repository, which allows you to make changes locally, but it doesn't allow you to make changes on GitHub. Okay, so in order to know which, so your, your repository will be connected to your own fork, and you will see that if you type git remote dash v. So if I do git remote dash v, I see that it is connected to what's called origin, that is your remote repository, and it has the link that I'm connected to. But it allows me to push and pull from this whatever link appears from here. But you most likely also would like to pull changes from the original repository. So if you wanna pull changes from the original repository, if you just do git pull right here, if you just do git pull to pull your changes, it's the opposite from push, you will only be pulling changes from your own fork. It says, yeah, everything's up to date. But you also wanna pull changes from the original one, from this other one, because the original owners of the repository might be making some changes. So you wanna also pull in this direction. Okay. So to do that, this is exactly what you want to do. So you want to do, you want to name the other repository, like the upstream repository, the original one, and you want to pull from the upstream repository. So there are two names that we will hear often and often. There's the origin repository, that's your fork, and there's the upstream repository, that's the original. Okay, so we want to add the upstream repository 
with this command, git remote at upstream. You will need to do that in your local repo. So you will have to put it right here. And in here, instead of your name, you will have the original owner name. And then here you will have the name of the repository. If you do this step successfully, when you do git remote v, you will see that your local version is pointing at two GitHub repositories, origin, which is your fork, and upstream, which is the original repository. So origin here, upstream. So that you can pull all your changes from upstream into your local version. Because you also, you when you create a fork, you create a copy of the state of the repository at that moment. But if the original developers continue to do work on upstream, then your fork and your local version will be um, outdated. So you also want to pull changes from the upstream repository. And the way to do that, just to re re remind you, is to add the upstream link to your folder and do git pull upstream master. You want to do this regularly so that, and ideally before you make any changes, so that you always have the latest version of upstream before you start working. Okay. The main difficulties and why people are very scared of Git and GitHub is that there will be merging conflicts. People will try to work on the same repository and on the same file, and then Git will not allow different people to edit the same file at the same time because then I mean, we wouldn't know which one has priority. And this is a really funny joke because it says, this is Git. It tracks collaborative work of projects through beautiful distributed graph theory pre-model. Cool, how do you use it? No idea. Just memorize these shell commands and time them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project and download a fresh copy. And I've noticed that many students actually do this. Like if you have any pro problem, you delete things and do the Git clone again. Um, which, I mean, it, it's okay for once, like a um, few times, but if it's like your standard practice, then that's not very um, efficient. So you do want to learn how to manage errors. So one of the easy, one of the first types of errors that you will get is uh, merging conflict. So one common issue is when two people are pushing changes to the same repository, you are working locally, but you forget to do a git pool before, before you make any changes. Uh, when you try to put your changes, you can't because your code has diverged from the remote code. And just another keyword here, remote is what lives on GitHub. So here is, you would try to do git push, change, put your changes, and GitHub will tell you, well, no, you can't. The updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. That means that someone changed the remote or the GitHub repository while you were working locally, and now there's a conflict. This is, many times this is very easy to fix. You just need to do a git pool. And if people have been working on different files, the git pool will just bring the new changes into your computer and then you'll be fine. But if you try to do the git pool and you get another error, conflict, merging conflict error, that means that it will tell you exactly which is the file that has a conflict. And here you need to manually open the file. So open it and then see where the error is. GitHub will highlight it. So once you open the file, you will see this type of format. So it will tell you on one side, so in your computer, this is what you have. And then in the remote, this is what is there. So in one side, there was contact email support, blah, blah, blah. And in the other side was, please contact us at this. So there was a conflict on that specific line. So, and it will be separated by these greater than signs and equal signs. So you will see when you open the file that has the conflict, you will see both versions in there. So you have to manually delete you will have to delete these lines and all these lines, if this is the line that you wanna keep, or you have to delete all these lines and these lines, if this is the line that you have to keep. 
So you have to make a choice. You will have two versions of the pile. You get into the pile and you say, oh, this is the version that I want to keep. <clears throat> so to resolve the conflict, edit this section until it reflects the states you want in the merge result. Be one of the version or create a hybrid. It doesn't have to be one of the two versions. Once you have these two versions, you say, that, oh, actually there's a third way in which I can write this and then you resolve it. Then you need to save the file, add it again, git add, git commit again, and then git push. So basically what you're doing then is you had different commits, A, B, C. These are the commits that live in remote. In your local version, you had A, B, D. They had diverged, different commits. And what you're doing now, you, you have this patch here. So you have your A, B, D, and then this merge with C so that they are in the same version now. There are different exercises that you can do to practice. With, with Git and also one exercise to do is to fork this dummy repo and then add something to this uh, markdown file or to anything. So I have either advices, books, whatever you want to add and then add your changes or request to add your changes with a pull request. So once you are in your fork, you can push things to the fork and then you will open a pull request to the original repo so that they incorporate your changes in there. So one exercise is to do a fork of the dummy repo, clone it locally, make a change, push changes to your fork and then do a pull request. So basically that's what we have in this picture. You will do a fork of the dummy repo clone locally, make changes, push your changes to your fork, and then submit a pull request so that I incorporate your changes in there. Okay, so this is one, one exercise. There are many online resources for, for these topics. So if you didn't even know that there was a right way to name files, you should check out Jenny Bryan's notes. All of these are links. Uh, if you have never used Markdown, um, or if you want to learn more about Markdown, then you have you should check Cecilia Nell's notes. Uh, there are these notes if you have no idea what the shell is or the terminal, because I was using terminal commands like pwd to see where I am, cd to move, ls to show the files. If you don't know anything about that, there are notes about this. Um, if you're already familiar with the shell but want to explore more of this potential, there are also other notes. Uh, for more information on Git, there are different other notes as well. And lastly, there is a lot of work from uh, reproducibility research. So Carl Broma's notes are very good about this. And also Simona Picardi's class notes are also good for reproducible science.